Uh, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining me this evening. Uh, my name is Ken. I'm a park naturalist at Gulf Branch Nature Center. And I'm going to get started here by sharing my screen and we're going to do some uh, an introduction to winter raptors. Hope that's what you're all here for. Just there on the screen. So we up here and get started. All right. So we are going to talk about winter raptors. Um, real quick, just to make sure we're on the same page. We are not going to talk about birds that aren't here uh, during the winter. Um, this is a bar chart from eBird that shows the, um, I guess you'd say the relative abundance of the number of um observations of birds that are recorded in eBird. eBird collects uh, a lot of people's um birding lists, whoever likes to use it. Uh, it's a pretty great community science project. And if you're interested in birding or getting into birding or have been birding for a while but you don't use it, I suggest checking it out. It's a it's a really nice tool. Uh and it's got a lot of um things that you can check that can get you um help you find the birds you're looking for uh as well. So it's a really nice, it's a really nice tool. It's a really good uh, collection of data and I, I think it's really, really helpful. And I'm going to reference it a few more times because I've used some other things from the site uh, as well. Um, the uh, the grouping at the top is the uh, the vultures and the eagles and the hawks. The grouping at the bottom is the uh, is the falcons. Yeah. Uh, they're separated on the um, on the list there. So I, I threw them in. We'll come back and talk more about what the, what these numbers mean. But pretty much any of them that have green all the way across are, are birds that are here year round. Uh, and if you see gaps on any of them, it means they are migratory or in the move at some point. All right, so let's start with some notes for identification. Um, if if you, we've talked about birds before, you know I'm a fan of Sibley. Uh, I like the Sibley field guides. I think he does a really nice job with the art and also just in general with the um, uh, the descriptions and the field markings that are pointed out. Uh, he's got a series of posters. I'm not trying to sell any posters for him, but his Raptors poster is fantastic. It's all of Eastern North America, so it includes species you won't find uh, here in the East, but it has a nice um, uh, grouping of the of the animals by size, so you can see the relative size compared and, and the different sizes between, say, a kestrel uh, and a bald eagle. So that's really really nice. Um, so when you are out in the field, uh, and these th a lot, some of these notes are true for just about any kind of of bird. Uh, certainly helpful, but I'm going to try to focus it on on raptors because that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, when you're out in the field, one of the the, the main things you want to um, figure out is what's the size of the bird. Um, someone's got their mic on. If we can get a mute on that, that would be fantastic. Ah, thank you. All right. Um, uh, is the relative size and you know it's not about going out to the bird with a ruler and hoping that it stays there long enough that you can get a measurement. Um, it's really about um, kind of guesstimating the size of the bird. Some birds I think are are pretty familiar to most everybody. Birds like um, crows or American crows or American robins, uh, and so getting an idea of how close these birds are to each other or how they relate in size is a really good indicator of. Um, there's a really good step in identifying the bird you're looking at um, and size will be a factor in the birds we're talking about today. Um, also, the shape of the birds. OK, uh, and you can see here eagles nice and big. Budios is another is another group of, of uh, birds of prey. We're going to look at exhibitors slightly smaller and some of the falcons are smaller as well, though there's a lot of overlap um, between these last three, but eagles are definitely our biggest. Figure out. Let's go ahead and mute. There we go. All right. So, uh, notes for identification: color pattern. Um, some of our birds have color patterns that even overlap, not just size, but they have very similar color patterns. And some some can be really easy, um, and some uh, may not be so easy to to use as identification. Uh, some really stand out, like the bald eagle, which we'll talk about. That's you know, if you got a mature bald eagle, uh, it's pretty hard to mistake that for another bird if you get a, a pretty decent look uh, at the animal. Um, and so color pattern uh, can help as well. Uh, number three, behavior. What's the bird doing? This is actually, you know, really, really important. It's not just, um, you know, when you look through a bird guide, you see pictures of birds um, and they're getting a lot better than than some of them when I was a kid where they um, you know, start to include a lot more um, action shots or images of, you know, what the birds look like soaring or hovering or diving or, or um, sitting on the water. Uh, and so, you know, they've gotten better at including those um, 
concepts of behavior as, as part of the, the field guide. Um, here in the uh, upper left is the osprey that's hovering over the water before it drops in after a fish. Uh, kestrels also hover, but you can see that it's two very different postures and two very different colors. Uh, and then uh, vultures will often bask in the sun, warming up their feathers and uh, as part of their daily routine. And so if you see a uh, larger bird of prey doing this, it's probably one of our vultures. Um, I don't remember, I don't recall seeing any of the other birds do the same activity as sunning as the two vultures do. Uh, habitat, where are you seeing your bird? Is it on a seashore or next to a large body of water where there's a lot of fish, like the osprey here? Is it um, something you're seeing pretty, uh, you know, along a, a roadside or a high, uh, highway? Uh, Red-tailed hawks have a, a pretty good reputation as highway hawks. Is, is something you see very regularly along highways. Uh, it's one of my, we drive to Massachusetts for family get-togethers and, you know, eight-hour drive. I look for a lot of hawks. It's, it's, it, 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 keeps me awake and keeps me interested in the drive and uh, I, I'm always looking for them on the side of the road or is your bird you know in the woods there are some uh, of our hawks that you're more likely to find them in and among the trees or in an area where there's lots of trees next to an open space um, than just out in, in big old open space what are the calls uh, this is a red-shouldered hawk and they have a call that they repeat um, and it is definitely different from the red-tailed hawk, which is a and it just continues out, um, and which many Hollywood filmmakers, unfortunately, have used as the sound for bald eagles, because bald eagles have a very, very different call from that. Um, but if you're able to identify these calls, that can help you with identifying the, um, the hawks if they make them. Cooper's hawks don't tend to vocalize except with their mate around the nesting season. So for some species, the... Uh, the calls aren't going to be helpful at all. So it really depends on what your uh, what your bird is and, and whether or not they will be vocal. The other problem is sometimes you have birds that are really good at imitating it. Um, I like I will be more than happy to add a bird to my list when I'm out birding if I hear it. Um, but with red shoulder hawks, I'm actually going to make sure I see the bird because if I see blue jays and I haven't seen any hawks and then I hear a red shoulder call, I'm not trusting it. Um, one of my uncle's favorite hunting stories was about the day he got absolutely nothing during small mammal season up in Pennsylvania because he had a blue jay follow him around for most of the afternoon. And every time he stopped to look around, the blue jay let off with a bunch of red-tailed hawk calls. Um, so they are very good mimics. So sometimes you can't trust that call. Uh, but if you see the bird and you hear a call, it can certainly be helpful in identification. So let's put it all together. You've seen a bird. Um, that may or may not be a raptor. So when you're looking at the bird, there's a lot that you can take in. You know, what is the bill shape and the color? Um, some of our, our raptors do have different colors on their bills, um, but you know, definitely if it's got a, a sharp curved pointy beak like that, you're definitely looking at um, a bird of prey. You know, how big is it? Where are we? What's the habitat you're looking at in? The, the color of the bird, the tail color, are there bands? What's the shape of the tail color? Is it long or short? Um, your leg color and the shape of the feet and the toes. In this case, they got these really, really big curled claws on it. Um, is it making any songs or calls, or any noises at all? And what are the behaviors? In this case, the bird's eating a fish because the habitat's in is right next to the, the river. Um, and so that's a really big clue to the identity of this bird. Uh, and don't go get caught up in names. Just because a bird is called a red-tailed hawk doesn't mean it always has a red tail. Juveniles rarely do. But there are other thing, other identification tricks like the belly band, which can help you realize that you are in fact looking uh, at a red-tailed hawk. Uh, and then there will be variations. These obviously aren't birds of prey, but they um, hint to the fact that you can have um, different color morphs. In this case, this is a, a hybrid between a, um, a wild mallard and a domesticated duck. Um, you might have a, a slightly leucistic bird like this cardinal it's got a lot of white feathers around the head or a much more leucistic bird like this uh this robin i've seen several pictures of leucistic um uh, red tail hawks which are just absolutely gorgeous birds so you know be ready for these tricks uh and speaking of tricks there are always there's always a chance that rarities are a possibility that you might see something that's completely out of its range i believe my first uh, crested caracara on my life list is actually from Delaware. 
<laughs> uh, and that was a bird way outside of the typical range. Crested the Caracara is something you'll find along Texas and um, you know maybe the Gulf Coast and, and out westward along the, the border with Mexico there. It's not something you're going to typically find in Delaware, but that bird was there, I think, two years in a row. I don't know how well it did. Um, this cartoon is about the stellar sea eagle, uh, which is a at best a rarity up in Alaska. It's more of a, a bird that you'll find uh, along the coast of Russia. Um, but this one popped up in Western Massachusetts, uh, probably Eastern Massachusetts, like central to Eastern Massachusetts. And now it's ended up in Maine. Um, and there are a lot of reports of it because a lot of people are going there because this is a lifer for a lot of people. Even people have been birding for many years. It's probably a first for for many of them unless they've been out to Russia or up in Alaska and got lucky. Um, so there are always rarities. We're going to. We're going to play a numbers game today. We're going to talk about some of the birds that are more common. The birds are more likely to be in this habitat. The birds are more likely to do this habit or the birds are more likely to look like this. Um, but there's always there's always the possibility that there's the bird that hasn't read the book or didn't have the exact genetics that we're typically you know used to seeing. Uh, and so it's, it's possible that you can see rarities. You might see variations. Um, but like I said, we'll we'll do a lot of, of, of playing the numbers and, and sticking with what you know the majority of time is is, is likely for you to have seen or heard uh, when you're out and about. So let's get rid of, out of the way here. I'm sticking with raptors, and I'm not including owls in my raptors today. I'm talking about the birds that you're going to see out during the day. Uh, so we're skipping the nocturnal raptors. These are our three most common uh, the nocturnal owls. I'm skipping the three most common. Are, I'm showing you the three most common owls in uh, Arlington County. Uh, the Great Horned Owl on the left, Eastern Screech Owl in the middle, and Barred Owl on the right. Um, I think nine times out of ten, if you see an owl in Arlington, it's probably going to be a Barred Owl or a Great Horned Owl. Um, we do have Eastern Screech. I think they're small. They're a lot easier to uh, overlook. This picture is from uh, ones that were seen in Tuckahoe Park. Uh, I've heard Eastern Screech call in uh, Gulf Branch uh, once or twice, which is always kind of fun to just be at the right place and hear them let a couple rip. I had a saw what owl land outside my living room last winter. Uh, my wife and I were watching hockey and happened to hear this bird call in the tree right outside the house. Never saw it. You know, it's kind of luck of the draw with these guys as well. But they, um, there's probably more owls in Arlington than we're aware of, but it's a pretty urban area, so the owls have to be really um, tolerant of that as well. So these are three of the most common. Barred owl, I think, is far and away the one you're going to see the most because they also tend to be the most, the ones that are more active during the day at times if, if needed. Um, short-eared owl, I think there was one record on eBird of a short-eared owl. That was at National Airport. There's another record of a long-eared owl in, uh, in Tuckahoe a couple years ago. Totally by, uh, you know, just probably happenstance and the bird stopped here on its way through. I haven't seen any other reports. And then uh, snowy owls, you know, whenever snowy owls have a, a pretty good year, uh, the males tend to go a little further during the winter trying to find territory that isn't already the younger males trying to find territory that isn't already staked out from older, more experienced males. So you tend to find them further and further south. Um, I know there's several spotted in Massachusetts this year. Uh, obviously, there's if you've been reading any of the news over the last couple of weeks, there's one in uh, the National Mall has been seen a lot around Union Station specifically uh, that has really uh, gotten people pretty excited. In Arlington, uh, the best place to go for snowy owl is uh, Gravelly Point. Nine times out of ten, there's one that ends up at the uh, National Airport. And the best viewing spot without getting yourself in a lot of trouble uh, is Gravelly Point across the uh, Roaches Run uh, mouth there, where you can look into the uh, the northern ends of the uh, the runways at least, and the, and the airport property to check out uh, and look for. Uh, a couple years ago, when we had a really big uh, eruption of snowy owls, we had a snowy owl at uh, National two years in a row. You could go to Gravelly Point probably just about any time of day and find a couple guys sitting there with scopes uh, on the airport, ask them to look, and if the bird was there, they'd show you. So it was really nice. Uh, Dulles gets them a, a lot too. Dulles is another good spot for snowy owls. It's also a good spot for short eared if you can get there at the right time. Short eards tend to come out a little before um, dusk. So uh, that's the magic time for catching one of those critters. Uh, we won't be talking about the migratory raptors because they're not here during the winter. Uh, Mississippi kite. We are probably at the we are at the very northern end of their range. I don't know that you can go much further north to find these uh, these birds. We've had them nest in Arlington for a couple of years. I don't know that the last two or three, if, if anybody's been reported, um, they are migratory. They'll, you'll find them down in, in South America. 
you know, winter months they come through uh, in spring and you can see again by this animation that you know very uh, limited amount up in Virginia, mostly a much much of a much more southern bird. I'll show that animation one more time, um, but you can see it's my cursor. They come up into Virginia and they, you, you get them up into Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Occasionally, um, but this is um, I don't know if it's an expansion or not, but typically if you look at the range maps, they usually stop down here along the, the southern uh, Atlantic and the, the Gulf Coast. Uh, Mississippi kite uh, broadwing hawks. We get these pretty regularly for migration, but they're here and gone. Uh, here's their migration again, South America, and then they'll zip up through the US. And so during those migration months, April, May, maybe early June, and again, September, October, you'll see them. Uh, I remember sitting uh, out on the porch with uh, the porch, the um, patio uh, at Gulf Branch with one of my coworkers, watching them just go in a single file line uh, up in the sky, really high up, but it would, you could identify them as, as Broadwing Hawks, and that was pretty neat. Uh, and Osprey, another bird that has migrated. Yeah, they're working this time. Um, you know, you find them worldwide, a lot of different places, and you can go down to Florida and see osprey just by any time of year. You can see that that purple coloration doesn't change a whole lot there in uh, in Florida, but around here they're pretty much um, uh, a migratory bird. You're not going to see them till early to mid spring, uh, and then all of a sudden they're just out there hunting fish like they've been there the whole time, and they're they're a lot of fun. Um, I wasn't. There's a few records in Northern Harrier. I wasn't going to talk too much about the Harrier, but if I was to talk about the Northern Harrier, which is one of my favorite birds of prey. Um, they have a facial disc, a lot like uh, the way you see a, an owl's face, uh, and they always have this white rump patch. That white rump patch is really helpful. Uh, the males tend to be gray, the females tend to be brown, um, but these are birds that really like open field. Um, they hunt by flying low over the field. They'll hover in place before they drop after their prey. Um, don't have a lot of really good real estate in Arlington for this. Again, you know, National Airport, maybe some areas uh, that are open. Um, There's just not a lot of, of uh, places to go. Um, but if you can get out in the areas where there's a lot of farmland, a lot of pasture land, where there's a lot of open space, and not a lot of trees, um, I don't think you have to go very far um, to have a chance at, at checking out some Northern Harriers. And they are really neat, beautiful birds. They're one of my favorites to, to see, uh, probably because you don't see them a lot around here. Um, so let's start. I tried to group our birds into well, groupings as a way of saying. So we're going to start with um, large blackbirds. Okay, we're going to go by um, four different groupings. We're going to talk about large blackbirds. We're going to talk about uh, beauties, exhibitors, and falcons. And I'll explain what all those are as we get to each one. But the large blackbirds, oh, we've got vultures. Um, I'd like to think everybody's pretty, com pretty comfortable uh, with the vultures. Uh, we have two kinds of vulture you're going to see here, the turkey vulture and the black vulture. I, I hope. One of the main differences is pretty obvious just by looking at the picture. If you're looking at a turkey vulture, you got a red head. If you're looking at a black vulture, you have a black head. If you have a bunch of large blackbirds on the side of the road uh, standing over a carcass, you've got vultures. Um, these guys are pretty easy to spot. Black vultures tend to be black all over. If you get a good look at turkey vultures, they look darker or black from a distance, but they actually, they're very dark brown. Uh, and there's some beautiful shades of brown actually in their feathers, which I'm sure not a lot of people call vultures beautiful, but <clears throat> here we are. Um, so that red head, that black head, if they're perching, that's your, your instant, easy diagnostic, which kind of vulture is it? Um, if you can see that in flight, great. If you can see that red head in flight, that's fantastic. Or the black head, then you know which bird you have. Um, but from a distance, especially when they're soaring, it might be difficult to see the color of head. So here's a couple of other ways to look at that. On the left is a black vulture. On the right uh, is a turkey vulture. What you'll see is there are... Um, areas where the, the feathers look very light, uh, it's the feathers, I always think of them as the fingertips, so the feathers on the end of the wings and the black vulture, and the feathers, all these, these flight feathers here on the turkey vulture, these are all much lighter than the rest of their body, and they show up like that, and that's the easy, easy diagnosis. If you got this light white or silver at the ends of the feathers, or at the ends of the wings, black vulture. If it's all along the trailing edge of the wings, it is a turkey vulture, okay? Um, I can actually kind of make out, uh, if not the reddish face, certainly the whitish beak here where this head looks all black. So that might be helpful as well. Um, one other thing that I've always noticed, these are not to scale. I don't want to give the idea that they are. But nonetheless, to me, the black vulture always looks stubby. There's just not the same kind of distance 
relative to its body from the tip of its beak to the end of its tail, which is pretty straight cut off, where you've got more of a, a curved or almost pointed tail on the turkey vulture and, and a longer distance, a longer length between the tip of the beak and the end of that tail. And so um, turkey vultures appear, appear larger, um, both you know, with their wing length, but also the, the length of their body than black vultures, which just seem to have like a stubbier wing and a, and a shorter stubbier body. Um, so I've, you've always used that uh, kind of relative size to help me as well uh, in identifying the two. But this, I mean, this, I just, I don't think it gets any easier. Um, of all the birds we're going to talk about, these, I, distinguishing these two are really the easiest because of that, the location of these light colored patches on their, uh, on their wings. Um, they tend to be soaring. Uh, I don't know that the, um, there's a lot of habitat difference between field and, and forest. Obviously, open space is going to be going to lend to them a little bit more. Don't tend to find them along, you know, the edges of the river or, or along the coast. But, you know, definitely in where there's a lot of open space and they can soar and look for the food. And they're also very good at smelling. Um, most birds don't have a, much of a sense of smell, but vultures, because of obviously the food they're looking for, carrion, uh, dead, uh, dead organisms, um, they actually have a pretty good sense of smell, which can help them find what they're looking for. Those um, telltale signs on the wings, uh, on the black vulture, you can even see it from the top. Uh, this picture is actually taken from uh, the end of our trail at the Nature Center that goes out to the Potomac, and there's an overlook there, and these guys were flying over the uh, forest on the other side, and I was able to get that. Um, you can't quite see quite the same angle, but you can see even from above uh, on the turkey vulture that it's um, it's still you know it's still pretty dark. What I do want you to see is this di this uh, dihedral shape where it's kind of it's slightly a V, you know here on the black vulture straight across, straight across. But on the turkey vulture here, you can see kind of a you know the the wing tips are up higher than the body, uh, and you get kind of this V shape, and that is uh, also pretty indicative of. Um, a turkey vulture it can help you from quite a distance away to let you know you're looking at a turkey vulture. Uh, the other large black bird you'll find around here are bald eagles. I think bald eagles are pretty easy, whether they're sitting or in flight, especially a mature one. Let me say that first. A mature bald eagle is pretty easy identification. Uh, you got a white head, you got a white tail. Nice and simple. Okay. It gets a little trickier when you start talking about juveniles because juveniles, it's a couple years before they get that white head. Uh, this is easily our largest uh, raptor or largest bird of prey that you're going to find around here. So you get this big, big bird um, that really, really is going to make the difference. Osprey are pretty large as well, but they are not bald eagles. They have similar habitat. Habitat. Uh, they like to be close to water as well. So habits. They they will eat uh, fish also. Uh, bald eagle will eat fish. They'll also steal fish and steal food from other critters. Uh, osprey are more of a of a simple fishing bird they just they go after the fish that's what they eat they try not to be around bald eagles bald eagles will chase and bother them to, to try to get them to, to drop or give up their fish um if you see an osprey it can be you can have that moment where you're not sure what you're looking at uh because they do have a white head but they have this brown stripe through the side of their head and through their eye uh and they also don't have a dark body like the bald eagle a lot of their body uh, down the, the center here is white. So there's a lot more white on the osprey, and it's pretty obvious whether it's perched or in flight. Um, and I want to talk just briefly about the osprey here. Like, I, you know, even though I, I said we wouldn't really talk about much, this picture is by uh, one of our, uh, oh, I didn't give him credit. So sorry. Uh, this picture is by one of our volunteers, David Howell. And he took a uh, this photo of this osprey eating this fish out of four mile run uh, on December 5th or 9th. I can't remember. There was still open. There's still fish. Bird didn't need to go anywhere. Um, that bird's probably not hanging around here anymore because it got colder and a lot of stuff started freezing. That makes it a little different. Uh, but generally, they're gone. They come uh, in the spring migration. They leave in the fall migration. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it gets trickier because they don't have the bald head right off when they fledge into um, uh, when they start when they fledge and they're ready to fly. And so you will see some large dark birds that don't have the white head or tail, but they are juvenile eagles. Uh, this is not a juvenile eagle. This is a golden eagle. I think we have like one or maybe a couple handful of golden eagle reports on. Uh, I'll get there uh, uh, in Arlington County. Uh, and you'll find you know them peppered around the eastern U.S. You have a couple of different areas where people have seen them. Uh, you can see there's a lot of white around the rump here and a little bit of white here, but compared to 
uh, a juvenile bald eagle, not nearly as much white underneath as, as you see on a juvenile bald eagle. And so that's a really good way to tell the difference. If you've got a large dark bird without a white head and you don't have a lot of white uh, underneath there on the wings, it's possible. Um, but again, like I mentioned earlier, if we're playing the numbers, large dark bird, even if it doesn't have white head, probably is going to be your um, your bald eagle. They're just they they really stand out. I have been birding as a hobby for I don't know well over a dozen years going on yeah going on a dozen um and i'm still you know in, in in certain circumstances i will still be amazed at how large an eagle can look in a tree especially if you got an eagle that lands in a smaller tree they just they're a big bird they're a large bird uh and they can really stand out sitting in a tree especially as closer to the ground they are if they're not too high up so let's talk about our hawks First one we're going to talk about is Buteos. Buteos have broad wings and short tails. These are the more common hawks that uh, people are probably used to seeing. Uh, and there's two spe species we're going to, to take a look at uh, of Buteos. Uh, one is the red-shouldered hawk. See, there's a lot of orange barring across the chest here, but males and females both have that pattern. Um, juveniles have more of a streaky pattern. It's pretty even. Okay, again, uh, neither of them have a, a red tail like the red-tailed hawk. They're red-shouldered hawks. Um, they are smaller than the red tail. They're only a couple of inches less in length, but they're I think eight or nine inches less in, in the wingspan. And so they do look like a smaller bird. They also tend to be a bird that you're going to find more in uh, in trees, uh, in forests, uh, close to edges. We've had um, red shoulders nest in our park for a couple of years, and they're they're nest easily well within the woods uh, and they do make use of the woods pretty well um, like i said red tails are more of a soaring bird they do a little more hunting from soaring and in, in, in open spaces um, these are a couple of pictures of red shoulder hawks you can't see that orange barring very well you got a hint there's a lot of orange on the belly but what i really want you to see I hope it'll stand out for you. It's certainly certainly at a, at a further distance. It'll really stand out for me on the tips of their wings. There is this light crescent. Shaping here. This is not 100% diagnostic. Apparently some. Uh, juvenile red tails uh, or some red tail morphs might have this as well, uh, but around here, uh, if we're playing the numbers, as I keep talking about, uh, if you see that crescent shape on the um, on the bird on the tip of the bird's wings there more than likely a, a red shouldered hawk uh also look there's really dark bands with skinny white bands on the tail uh and even a juvenile red tail that doesn't have its red tail yet is not going to have bands like that on its tail so you get these crescents you got the bands on the tail definitely looking at a, a red shouldered hawk uh, and they are pretty vocal so if you you know if you're seeing this and you hear that kia, 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 uh, you're really good to go with your ID there. Um, as I mentioned, they are definitely uh, a bird that frequents uh, forests and woodlands um, and pay attention to the things that they're hunting. In this case, this is uh, late February, early March. Uh, this is one of the, one of the the pair that were nesting here in the park. And as you hopefully you can make out. That's a wood frog uh, that it caught uh, while the wood frogs were making their way to the pond uh, for their uh, annual mating uh shindig if you will and these red tails or these red shoulders just sat over the pond for about two weeks you know they're watching for the hop, the frogs hopping like we i remember I, I have a vivid memory of watching several frogs coming down the the uh hill and all of a sudden this red tail or this red shoulder just dropped into the leaf litter and then popped back up and i was like what was he doing um and then i happened to snap this picture and notice later that there's a frog in its claw and that's what it ate and and if they get a female uh, they're really lucky because there's a lot of extra protein in that the egg masses that the female's carrying as well uh, so these could be pretty rich uh, uh nutritious meals for these red shoulders. Um, barred owls will also exploit wood frogs during their um, their uh, annual mating migration and, and when they're in the ponds. And so both of these birds, uh, barred owls more at night, red shoulders during the day, uh, are, are a predator of the wood frogs. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, you know, habitat and uh, habits and behavior, you know, what are they doing? Uh, this is very much a, a red shouldered, uh, red shoulder hawks habits. Uh, red-tailed hawk, probably one of our more common hawks. 
certainly one of the one of the more well known, one of the easiest to identify. If you got a nice mature hawk, you got a nice red tail. Nice and simple. Moving on, next bird. Just kidding. Um, not every red tail has the red tail. And so that's not always something you can look for. This is a red tail hawk in a tree. It doesn't have a red tail, um, but it's in an open spot in a tree. It's in a tree next to an open spot where it can see quite a distance. You know, this is the kind of shape also you want to look for on the sides of highways. This is what will tip you off when you're looking at uh, a red tail hawk. What I want you to notice here is there's a belly band. And that belly band is really, really helpful when you don't have a red tail hawk, doesn't have a red tail, but you get that belly band. Usually it means you got a juvenile, uh, but that belly band will help you make that identification. Uh, there's also sometimes you'll see um, backpack straps on the back of the bird if you're seeing it from the back, uh, and that will help you identify uh, a red tail hawk as well. Uh, in flight, okay, from a distance, that red tail really standing out, which is really, really helpful. If you got bins or scope or another way to get a closer look, you can see, of course, the red tail. You can see that belly band. Uh, and excuse me, when I was an early birder, I remember hearing uh, some of the other birders talk about this comma or this this black dark um, patterning here uh, near the end of where the actual bones were at the at the base of the the wings of the feathers here, and um, calling that a you know this black comma. And if you see that comma, you know you've got a uh, a red tail hawk. I don't know that that's any more diagnostic than the, the belly band. The belly band can be really helpful, but some birds don't have the belly band. There's a lot of variation in red tail hawks, especially when you go to other uh, areas of the US. So um, these are all helpful. You know, if you see a combination of these, you probably got a red tail hawk. Um, just to give you an idea of that variation, this is uh, Sibley's Guide to the Birds of Eastern North America. And the red tail hawk, which seems just seems like such a simple, simple bird to identify, has two full pages of morphs and sub not quite subspecies, but different, you know, morphs and colorations that you'll find around the US. So you can see um, you know, that they are a common bird down here in the bottom left. You can see that range map, and they're a pretty common bird, and pretty year, much a year-round bird uh, around the US. Um, but there's all these different things. Our eastern bird that little corner of the second page. The rest of this is you know, Southwestern Creeders, Higher Harlands, a partial albino red tail hawk. These are different ones that um, you might see around areas. Maybe we could get the partial albino. Oh, I don't I don't know that that's what's seen very often. You know, dark, dark, dark adult, dark juvenile, which I think are more common in, in the Western uh, red tails. I remember living in Colorado for two years and finding red tails to be a lot more difficult to identify out there because I'd see a bird and be like, oh, this is awesome. What kind of bird? I, I got a new hawk. I'm so excited to add this to my life list. And then after you know going through the guide and, and taking a look at the picture, looking through the scope or whatever, I'm like, ah, it's just another red tail. Which again, red tails, I, I think, are, are one of my favorite birds. Um, but out here, they can be you know fairly uh, similar, pretty easy to identify. You got a lot of these traits, which are pretty common, but in other areas of the US, especially out west, they can be really difficult. They can be a lot more variable, a little tougher to get yourself to that identification. Um, let's talk about some exhibitors now. These are uh, smaller, uh, more narrow tailed hawks. Uh, their wings tend to be have, you know, they, they got the finger. I always think of these as fingers. I just I can't get away from that even though they're obviously feathers, um, but their feathers need to be tend to be a little more pointed out towards the, the end of the wing. Uh, they got these uh, more narrow tails. And they are hard. Um, they shouldn't be it should be super hard, but it's something that really comes with experience. If you ever try to identify downy woodpecker versus hairy woodpecker, it takes a little while. It takes use to getting to see the different sizes, it takes you know a little time of, of trying to see the outer tail feathers, trying to see the, the length of the bill. Um, and it, and again, when you're playing with numbers there, nine times out of 10, is, it's a downy. Harry's not as common. Um, with Coopers and Sharpies, it depends on the time of year. We get a lot more Sharpies during the winter. Uh, I don't think we see them at all in the summer. And it's also about the size of the birds, but there's a lot of overlap. Uh, if you know anything about our crows, we have fish crow and American crow. American crows tend to be bigger, fish crows tend to be smaller, but there's overlap. 
obviously their coloration is exactly the same. So you really, really the best way to go is by voice. Uh, you can't depend on voice for these guys. And there's a lot of overlap between um, male coopers. Coopers are the bigger species. Sharp shinders, the smaller species. Cooper's hawk um, are bigger, but in hawks, the in the the dimorphism between the species, the female or the dimorphism between the genders, the females tend to be larger, and the males tend to be smaller. So the lar the overlap between coopers and sharpies tends to be larger female sharpshins, uh, being similar size to smaller male coopers hawks. Uh, so that's there. So this is a, and again, this is this is very typical of what you would see, uh, you know, up in a tree. You, know, you got the very thin tail there. Um, Pretty, pretty, a little bit skinnier, not necessarily, not nearly as chunky as looking as a uh, red tail or a red shoulder. Uh, this is first thing in the morning uh, out in Delaware, uh, looking at the, this turned out to be, this is a, a Cooper's hawk. Um, but you got a sharp shin here on the left. We got our Cooper's hawk on the right. You can see they're both in the same genus, a sipiter, and it ma makes them very difficult to uh, identify. Um, and a lot of overlap, the same color on the on the rear of the wings and the top of the head. The eyes are similar in color. You've got a lot of similar patterning um, across the breast. Um, what we're going to do, is we're going to take a look at the tails. And we're going to take a look at a little bit of the head. Um, and see how we can just do that, discern that out. Here is a nice chart from uh, birdwatching, birdwatching-bliss.com, um, and you can see they range in size from the size of a common crow to a robin. Um, if you look at the sharp sharpies, and then you look at the two coopers, you can see the wings. The leading edge of the wings on the coopers is straighter than the sharp shin, where it's more comes more to a point. Uh, and the head of the sharpies doesn't extend very far beyond those points, whereas on coopers. The heads are definitely extending beyond the um, the bend of the front of the the wings, the elbows there, and so uh, that can be really helpful when these guys are in flight. Uh, you can see uh, a notch in the tail. They try to hint at here for the sharpies versus coopers, which don't tend to have that. But again, you can have a bird that's missing uh, tail feathers. You can have birds that uh, have damage to the tail feathers, and um, that can be really tough. There's no shame in filling out a bird list and putting exhibitor species because you saw it and you didn't get a good look at it. You saw it because it was quick. You saw it because it zipped by um, or you saw it really far away. You didn't have a scope. You had a pair of binoculars and there was so much you could get out of it. You know, getting into exhibitor is certainly uh, still a win. Uh, so here's our Sharpie, Sharp Shin Hawk. Um, they tend to have a more rounded head. It's not as blocky. And their tail, and um, this is something I was I was taught early on, and, and, and sometimes it's helpful, sometimes not. Their tail does not tend to have a lar a long term a wide terminal band of white on it. Um, although this is not as helpful as reading in a book, this is not as helpful uh, in the spring as it is in the fall and winter. Um, but their their tail tends to be more straight across, and they often you'll find this notch in it. Whereas when you're looking at Cooper, they'll have a they might have a blockier head. Uh, but you don't tend to see that notch and their tail the end tends to be curled curved more uh, and you'll also see this when they're in flight let's see if i can get back to that you might be able to see that in flight though not as much you can see there's a little more curve to the end and this is a little more straighter uh and ends straight across let's come through here um so here's a picture i took uh several years ago at fort cf smith and if you can see there's um wide black and white alternating bands on the tail um, so that should get you away from a red shoulder. Sometimes that that orangish coloration you'll see on the breast of these birds can make it and their size can make them look similar to red shoulders. Um, but the black and the white band on the tail are pretty even as far as their width. And that is not what you hopefully if you remember you saw on the red shoulder where the black bands are much wider and the white bands are much skinnier. Um, uh, and initially, I, I, you know, I went back and forth on whether this was a Sharpie or a Cooper because there's not a lot of white on the end of that tail, but it is a very rounded tail in flight. Uh, and you can see the head is sticking out ahead of the leading edge of both of the wings and they're not very tented or, or um, triangular looking. And so this was a Cooper's Hawk. Uh, and again, if you remember up in the, whoops, I did not want to do that. Up in the corner, uh, there was another bird. That was a crow that was bothering uh, the scoopers at the time. Um, you can see the size of the crow. Uh, and this bird was pretty, looked definitely smaller than the crow. So I, I went with, uh, my guess is it's probably a male cooper talk. I'm happy if I can get to coopers or to sharp shin. Um, male and female, it's a whole other thing. I'm not, I'm not that worried about yet. I don't have that, that need to be that distinct with my bird. If I can get it to species, I'm pre pretty happy. 
Um, if you have a bird feeder in your yard and you have a hawk that is, depending on the, how much you like your small birds, either feeding on them or bothering them, it's a distinction that people do make. Um, but if you do have a hawk hanging out, it's probably a sharp shin or a cooper's hawk. And depending on what they're attacking and eating will tell you which one it is. The coopers, because they're larger, tend to have larger prey. They go for, they'll go for j size birds or larger, including uh, morning doves. They seem to really, really prefer morning doves as a food. That is what is being eaten right here. Uh, this is another photo by our volunteer, David Howe, who shared it. Uh, and I haven't yet emailed him back to it because he, he said that um, he thought it was a Sharpie. Uh, and I can see why he thinks that. But um, the book I was reading was pretty definitive. If it's, if it's a, easily catching and eating, uh, morning doves, it is probably Cooper's hawk because of the size. Uh, the sharpshins tend to go more for uh, sparrows, uh, finches, and the smaller birds. The occasional jay, if it's a pretty large uh, female sharpie, but even a jay can be a pretty good, uh, pretty good match for uh, a large female sharpie. So they tend to stick with the smaller birds. So depending on what their prey is, you know that can help you as well. Any clue? Some of these birds, it can be really difficult. So any clue that can help you figure out who you're looking at uh, is a good clue. Let's finish up with the falcons here. Uh, the falcons tend to have also a slender tail. They also have long slender wings that are more sharp or pointed that you're looking at there. So um, <clears throat> to me, I think the easiest one of these to see around here is the kestrel um, because I can tell you where to go. This photo here, uh, the one in flight is taken at Longbridge Park, uh, our new, one of our newer parks. You know, they got the new aquatic center there. Um, you can also see them at National Airport. Both of those are really good spots to see them. Got a lot more open space, which is what uh, kestrels tend to uh, uh, approve or tend to want to where the kestrels tend to hunt. Sorry, um, and I'll come back to that a little bit later because I'm going to I'm going to compare these guys together. But this is the American kestrel. See a lot of nice bluish gray and, and orange. It's it's for a, a bird of prey. It's it's actually pretty brightly colored. Really really pretty birds. One of my favorites. Uh, and they're they're small. They're not very large. Uh, birds of prey next size up on the falcons you find around here are merlin um where kestrels are not very common although in the right habitat you can find them pretty readily uh even in the right habitat merlins are not even commonly uncommon they're just not birds you're going to see very often um we ha i have seen them in arlington there are sightings in arlington and in uh the surrounding areas uh but it's just not a common bird and these are the two that tend to be the kestrel and the merlin tend to be um mistaken pretty readily because again you see kestrel a lot more so nine times out of ten you think eh, it's a kestrel and that one time where you're thinking maybe this is a merlin it may or may not be uh but it can still that seed of doubt so i'm going to try to help with that in a little bit here this is a, a merlin that was hanging out in uh, uh barcroft park uh this is my opening picture from the program and this is one that was at huntley meadows um and again even even though it's it's this one you can't really tell, but even this is you zoomed in some you can see that mustache and hopefully um, I want to talk about it more later, which is why I haven't mentioned it. But the the three falcon species you'll have we have you can see they all have some form of a mustache on their face. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the Merlin has here, but the Merlins tend to feed on birds. Um, and so this one was definitely feeding on one of the birds here, but there was uh, one or two. I can't remember how many in Huntley a couple of years ago, and um, people were making the trek out there just to see the Merlins because they're they're interesting birds. Um, uh, and they're much more like I said, they're a little more rare and they're much they're more prized in some ways by birders because they're harder to find. Uh, and then the peregrine falcon, which is just. Even for people that have seen them, even for people that see a lot of birds, just it's it's a really neat bird. They they tend to be um, they tend to do well in urban areas because they like to nest on cliffs and tr buildings look like cliffs, <clears throat> so they can be pretty exciting. And again, it's a big predator. Big predators always have a little bit of mystique to them. So let's take a look at our three species, compare them. Uh, first, we're going to go with kestrel versus merlin. Kestrel is the smallest of our three species. Uh, merlins are are near near in size. Sometimes the the females can be uh, hard to distinguish from uh, female uh, female merlins from female kestrels. Um, this is a male. Got this nice dark gray and the orange here. The one of the keys here and the the mustaches tend to be very um, easy to spot in kestrels. They have two. You got one behind the eye and one behind in front of the eye. So these got two th these two bars here, uh, and neither of the other two species have that. Uh, the Merlin has a little bit of a bar there. It's not nearly as uh, obvious, uh, but just a single bar coming down in front of the eye. 
OK, they hunt for two very different things. Uh, Kestrels hunt for small mammals and insects. They hover and then drop. So they're if you see a bird that's hovering uh, and then it just drops in and it looks faintly Kestrel, Kestrelish or Merlinish, almost completely going to be a Kestrel if you see this behavior. Merlins tend to be more energetic hunters. They, co they come out from a perch or, you know, they're already in flight when they spot their prey, uh, whether it's a, another bird or some of the larger insects like dragonflies. Uh, they often hit them from underneath. They come up at them, but they come at them fast. They come, they make sharp turns uh, and they really are a very active and, and quick hunter. They they can fly really, really fast and that's how they get them. Uh, I mentioned the, the difference in commonality and how, which one's more common or not. Um, the other thing is if your small falcon is perched on a wire and it's bobbing its tail, kestrel. Merlins may occasionally perch on a wire, but that's really rare thing. It's not typically what they like to do. If you're out, especially if you're in an area where there's a lot of open field, I like to do a lot of birding. And whenever I can get out, I like to get out to like Delmarva. There's a lot of open fieldish space for place uh, critters like the the harrier I talked about earlier. Um, and I'm always struggling to because I kind of watch the road if I'm the only one driving, but I'm always like trying to check the wires whenever I can because if I see a shape on a wire, always looking to see if it's a Kestrel. Um, and usually I can get one just about every trip because they're they're you know pretty common in those open areas and they love to sit on wires looking for where they're going to hunt next. And as I mentioned earlier, um, if you're at Gravelly Point looking towards the airport, check the fence along uh, the, the northern end of the airport there. I've seen uh, Kestrel sitting there before, which is a really good place to spot them. I've also seen them on the light post at Longbridge Park. So that whole area is not a is a really good spot for finding kestrels. Uh, like I said, Merlins are a little less common. If you're going to go look for a Merlin, it's almost to your benefit to go somewhere, go onto a uh, an internet site like eBird and look to see where they've been spotted around and try to get to an area where they've been spotted recently. Um, because you can't just show up and, and get uh, Merlins in certain areas. They, they they do move around a little bit. They're much less common. Peregrine falcon versus Merlin. Whoops. Uh, mustaches. Again, kind of a faint one on the must uh, on the Merlin. The peregrine falcon only has one, but it is a pretty strong mustache. Peregrine falcons are bigger. They just are. They're bigger. That's always, you know, if you've got a really large falcon you're looking at, uh, it's more than likely going to be um, a peregrine falcon instead of a Merlin. They tend to be paler, not as dark as Merlins, although some juveniles can be about as dark. Uh, they have longer wings proportionately than Merlins, so that could be really helpful uh, and seeing that again. They both hunt birds. Um, uh, if the bird is soaring high, it's much more likely that's a peregrine. And Merlins tend to, to fly lower uh, as they're hunting for their prey, so a, a soaring bird is much more likely to be a very peregrine falcon. One of the best spots to see peregrine falcon in Arlington again is Gravelly Point. There is uh, a bird that had been nesting on the bridge across the DC from Arlington. I don't know if it's still there or not one of those bridges, uh, but it's a pretty regular spot. I just was on eBird looking for some information to work on this recently this week, and somebody had posted photos of a peregrine that had tagged one of the pigeons in uh, Gravelly Point and was sitting there picking it apart and eating it in the parking lot. They got some really good, really good shots of it. Um, I was at Gravelly Point yesterday and trying to just get a couple of pigeon and gull pictures and all of a sudden they all took off and I'm like who scared them <clears throat> and it occurred to me there was nothing really going on in the parking lot so I looked around and finally spotted a sharpie a sharp shin hawk flying over that had, had come and it had freaked out the birds and the pigeons took off in their um their little uh evasive flight pattern the gulls were just like we're going out and sit in the water for a while uh, and eventually the birds came back and the, the sharpie kept moving on its way so um you know, these open, more open spaces like Gravelly Point can be really good magnet for some of these birds. So, let's say you're going to go birding. A couple of really quick, real quick things. Um, if any of you are signed up for the program on Saturday, there's a pretty good chance it won't go, and I'll talk more about that uh, here in a couple minutes at the end. Um, so, I want to throw in a couple of birding tips at the end of this just for anybody. It is really easy to go to a store and buy a whole bunch of stuff to go birding, a spotting scope and a tripod, a pair of binoculars, maybe a camera as well, a whole bunch of birding books and all kinds of things like that. Really, um, you can narrow it down to an old pair or trusty pair of binoculars and a birding book. But you don't even need that. If you got a bird feeder outside, that's all you really need to watch the birds. You know, everything else is just a little bit of help. Um, so don't let not having a bunch of equipment stop you from getting out and enjoying the birds that are, that are out and about. Um, there are a few books if you do want books. There's a few books that are really good for identifying uh, raptors. 
Um, as I mentioned, I like. Excuse me, David Sibley. Here's a book that him and Pete Dunn and Clay Sutton wrote uh, called Hawks in Flight. Um, identify yourself if you're if you're just into birds in general. Identify yourself is one of my favorite books. It's about birding identification challenges. They have a chapter on exhibitors. They have a chapter on the falcons. They have a chapter on woodpeckers. They have a chapter on uh, gulls. They have a lot of really good chapters in there. Um, it is a really good book for trying to muddle through some of the more difficult clumps of birds that um, look very similar and are hard to to suss out when you're on the field. Uh, Kaufman has a field guide to advanced birding and then the Crossley ID guide. Um, there's a Crossley ID guide just for all the birds of Eastern North America. There's a Raptors one. There's also, I think, a uh, a Ducks one, which I haven't seen yet. But uh, the Crossley ID guide, I think, is really better for the Raptors and the Ducks. So that he did separate ones of those, I think, is really, really, really good. But the Raptors ID guide has, like, these big pages where they Photoshop all these birds in. It looks really good, but they Photoshop all these birds in. So you've got this big scene with all these birds and different. Uh, well, you can see right there in the D, all these birds in different uh, turns and, and angles. And uh, and so you it, you know, it challenges you like what's bird 17 and then there's a key. And so it's a really good way to learn it. And, and it's a really nice step by step book into. Uh, visual identification of these birds out in the field. You know, I, I think it might be the next best thing to actually get out the field. If you can't do that is is going through this book. It's a really good book on uh, identifying raptors. Um, places to go in Arlington. Uh, you can see the the top three are all really good spots there. Fort C.F. Smith, Port Potomac Overlook, Long Branch. These are all really good for b birds in general. Gravelly Point and Roachers Run are, are on opposite sides of uh, uh, 395 GW Parkway. Um, you can only get them in one direction, so plan your drive accordingly, uh, but they're both really good spots there. And there's a few other places as well that are really good. Gulf Branch, I think, is number 11 or 12. I don't know how we got pushed down off the top 10 by one of these guys, but um, they're all really good spots to go uh, birding. Uh, number one, again, that's Gulf Branch and uh, uh, Old Glebe is a little green above it here. Uh, it's a really, you know, it's a pretty good spot. There's a nice overlook here. If you take the hike trail all the way out across the NPS land, there's a nice overlook over the Potomac where um, you know, I've seen some really good raptors out there. Two is Potomac Overlook. Three is Fort C.S. Smith, which is, I think, maybe the best uh, destination in the county as far as uh, uh, birds go, especially migratory birds in the spring and the fall. Uh, four is no oh, four is uh, Gravelly Point and uh, Roaches Run. This is Gravelly Point right here. We've got Roaches Run. Uh, seven is Barcroft Park. Six is Long Branch Nature Center, Glen Carlin Park, and then five is uh, Upton Regional. So a lot of good spots. We don't have a lot of. You know, open space in Arlington County, but we have some really good spots that are are fantastic for uh, looking for birds. This is also on the um, uh, we have a I don't think I have it with me. I think I left it on my desk at the Nature Center. Um, we also have a bird list of the count for the county uh, that you can find online that we have paper copies at the Nature Centers, um, and this is in that as well as a guide to where you can go birding. And finally, let the other birds like this guy up here in the upper right show you where those birds are. Never ignore a bunch of crows yelling at somebody. Could be an owl, could be a hawk, could be a snake. I've had them uh, lead me to a rat snake before as well. So crows can be really, really helpful. And that's how, you know, there was, a, I think, a second crow as well. And that's how I noticed uh, this hawk was the commotion that the crows were making. And all the hawk wanted to do was get away and go somewhere else. So so thank you for joining me. Uh, there's another cartoon that more illustrates my uh, point about crows. <clears throat> You've all been very patient and I appreciate that. Um, I will, like I said, I will be putting up a recording of this uh, sometime soon. Uh, I'm going to check and see if there's any questions in the chat I may have missed. Nope. Uh, does anybody want to unmic if, the, if they have a question? If you have a question, not just a mic, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them now uh, while we're here. You're welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, my phone's going to start chiming all the time. Thank you, Emma. Um, well, I don't normally do this. You're welcome, Helen, but I'm going to take your silence to mean I did a pretty good job. Um, I'm going to stick around for another minute or two if anybody wants to ask any questions, but you're welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Um, but that is all I have for this evening. So thank you for joining me tonight. I, I know you have a million other things you could do, so I appreciate you all 
uh, spending some time with me. Can you take the red tail hawk call again? It just goes on and on as opposed to the red shoulder, which is so. Oh, I see a couple hands up. Um, I see. Well, Sherry, I see your name. And if you put your hand down, I'll know who the other person is. Oh, somebody said something that was very echoey. Uh, what do you have, yes. uh, Sherry? Oh, about Saturday. Um, you said that it might not happen. Yeah, it's so the, the problem with thank you for reminding me. So the problem with Saturday is the temperature is never getting out of the low 20s. Uh, and they're talking about 15 uh, mile per hour winds, especially in the morning where we've, we've got the snow overnight. We got the winds in the morning that, you know, 50 miles per hour. You're not going to get a lot of birds moving through. Uh, and the, the real feel that they're projecting right now is like four. It's like two or four degrees. It keeps changing every time I see it. The point is, it's going to be cold. And I think it's going to be too cold for the birds to even be active. I just don't think that they'll be out if it's going to be that windy and that cold. Um, and again, they obviously they have to live through it, but this might be one of those mornings where they're going to be like, Ooh, I don't think so. Um, so what is likely going to happen is after my, uh, after I log out of here, I'm probably going to uh, cancel and send out a notification to everybody. So I'm bummed that we won't be able to do that. Maybe somewhere down the road or at this point, it might have to be next season, but I will try to do it again, but it's just not the right weather. The irony is I'm also doing a keeping warm campfire uh, Saturday night. I'm probably going to have to cancel that as well because uh, that'll be families with young kids. And don't, I don't think I'm going to show up if, again. It's 24 and four is what it feels like. Uh, and the irony is I picked a good night for a keeping warm campfire. It's just too cold to, to even do it. So. Natalie, I will send out a confirmation email regardless. But like I said, I have a feeling tomorrow when I look at the, the, the forecast, it's just not going to be. It's not going to be worth it. I might get to it tonight, but I have a feeling I'm, I'm trying to hold out because I like to go birding, but I'll probably end up having to do it tomorrow. Yeah, I agree, Sherry. It's a bummer. You guys don't have to wait for me, though. Um, by all means, get out there and check it out. Longbridge is uh, um, I wouldn't park where the uh, the natatorium is, where the new pool is. I would park at the uh, over by the parking lot they had for the uh, athletic fields and just walk up the steps. And when you get to the top, there's a nice breezeway and you can look out over Roach's Run from the, the side opposite GW Parkway. Um, I've seen short. I've seen uh, Castro there. I mentioned that. Yeah, I've seen uh, Bald Eagle. I've seen Osprey. I've seen Red Tail Hawk. I've seen Sharp Shin Hawk. Um, I don't know if I've got Coopers over there, um, but it's just a, it's a really open spot. And so it's a really good place for getting raptors which is why i had originally scheduled the program there thinking that if we got out it was a place for everybody to spread out uh there's enough room for us to do that so we we're all clubbed together but hopefully to get a couple of raptors in but i just the, i don't think the weather's playing fair and it's probably we're probably not going to be able to do it because it's just going to be so cold it's it's not worth getting everybody out there and, and weather that is potentially uh hazardous to us and is, is probably going to make the birds say i'm not doing this this morning so have I ever been bird pooped on? That is a fantastic question. I don't think I have, but one of my favorite stories, I was lucky enough to go to the Galapagos at college, uh, and we were all looking at a short-eared owl there, which was fantastic, uh, when my friend behind me went, go, oh! and we turned around, and he had gotten hit on the side of the head by a frigate bird which is a really big bird. Frigates are big boats. Frigate bird's a big bird. And they got hit inside the head, and it just had come across his face and across his shirt and his shoulder. And being the good college students we were, we all laughed about it while one of the teachers actually tried to help him. Um, so I have not been, I've seen it happen. Uh, depending on the bird, it could be pretty bad. My car has it happen all the time, but no, I have not been. I don't think I've ever been bird pooped on myself. That snakes and lizards do it, but that's because they picked them up. So thank you, Allison. That was a fun question. All right, well, thanks, everybody. It is uh, 8.01. Uh, unless anybody has else has any Raptor programs, I'm going to go ahead and shut things down. Uh, and thank you all for joining me this evening. And um, I will hopefully see you around next time. Uh, next month, I'm doing, um, this isn't a deep dive, but I'm doing a deep dive next month on uh, some strange mating customs of animals. And it's going to be in person at uh, Lover Run. So I hope to see some of you in person next, next week, month. So thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.